Hi everyone, I want to keep this short. You all know about the great products here at Old Time Radio DVD. Well, now's the time to purchase. Why now? Just can't afford to keep on doing this forever for free. So go to oldtimeradiodvd.com, take advantage of our great pricing. Ah. The innkeeper said I was to be sure to look in on you, sir. <sighs> No matter how late. Yes, Anna, come on in. Good journey. Tolerable, sir, thank you. I had some light refreshment on the train. Mm -hmm. Do sit down. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you talk to Mr. Wimper? Yes, but sadly to little effect. Oh. However, a very short while ago, I did pay a brief visit to his lodgings while the occupant was out and discovered in his desk a roll of 20-pound notes. Crikey. Twenty-four of them. I made a list of the numbers. Perhaps you'll be kind enough to compare them with this list, which I obtained from Sergeant Kent. I think we may find that they're from the safe at Starboard. Gladly, sir. Won't take but a moment. Mm. Yes? Sergeant Kent, sir. Ah, come in, Sergeant. I, uh, apologise for lateness of power. Oh, no, no, no. No need. As you see, we're both still hard work. What can I do for you? There's been a development, sir. No. A, a week or so ago, Postmaster delivered to me a letter addressed to the heirs and assigns of the late Mr. John Roper. Mm -hmm. uh, since it occurred to him that the same might have a bearing on tragedy. Uh, I have it here, sir. Mm. As you will see, sir, it's from the Metropolitan Safe Deposit Company Limited, 25B King William Street, in the city. Yeah. Hmm. Mm hmm. Well, then. Dear sir or madam, we beg to bring to your notice that the late Mr. John Roper was the holder of a small safe in our strong rooms. <laughs> we should be glad to receive your instructions as to the disposal of its contents, your safe, etc. Hmm. Well, why should a man in Roper's position require the services of a safe deposit account? Oh, I wondered the same thing, sir. So, I wrote to King William Street requesting that they forthwith forward to me the contents of the box. Now, their reply reached me by the afternoon mail along with this sealed letter, which I now put into your care. And um, this is all that was in the box? Yes, sir, so it would appear. Then let's see what it says. Sir? Yes, Tanner? Eighteen of the numbers are on the list. Ah, that seems fairly conclusive. Hmm. Now then, um, what's all this? Hmm. Well, well. Has it a bearing on tragedy, sir? Possibly, Sergeant, possibly. At this juncture, it's difficult to say. Oh. But, um, thank you for all your efforts. Oh. Yeah. And, um... I, uh, I bid you good night. Ah, well, uh, good night, gentlemen. Something interesting, sir. Listen to this. The address at the top is Brayside, Kintillock, Fife, and it's dated the 15th of May, 1921. That's more than five years ago. Now, listen. I, Herbert Philpot, doctor of medicine, and at present assistant on the staff of the Morham Institute in this town, under compulsion and in the hope of avoiding exposure, hereby remorsefully confess that I am guilty of attempting the death of my wife, Edna Philpot, oh. by arranging that she should meet with an accident, and when this merely rendered her unconscious, of killing her by striking her on the temple with a cricket bat. Crikey! May God have mercy on me. Signed, Herbert Philpot. That's the local quack, isn't it? He bears the same name. Uh, a confession of murder, eh? But what was it doing in Roper's strongbox? I've no idea. It smacks of blackmail to me. And Tanner, bitter experience has taught me never to jump to conclusions. Yeah, but I... Bill Pot must wait. Our first priority must be to get the truth out of Whimper. We'll tackle him at the church. First thing tomorrow morning. We're just resetting the mullions. Come into the vestry room. I use it as an office. We won't be disturbed. Mr. Wimper, in your desk at your lodgings in Stanhope Road are £480 in £20 notes. You search my desk? How dare you? I'll complain... There is no doubt that these particular notes, along with the one you cashed at Thomas Cook's, were all in the safe at Starville shortly before the fire. Now, where did you obtain that money? 
I've nothing to say. Very well. A charge, Mr. Wimper, Tanner. What? Yes, sir. Uh, what with, sir? Robbery, arson, murder. What? Yes, sir. Then we'll take him into custody. W- one moment. Yes, Mr. Wimper? I assure you, Inspector, I didn't steal the money. And as for murder, well... Then how did the money come into your hands? I can see I must tell you the truth. Take this down, Tanner. Yes, sir. As I told you yesterday, Mr. French, as I left the church on the evening of the fire, I saw Roper outside the gate. He came up and he said he had a message for me from Mr. Avril. He said Mr. Avril would have written, but he wasn't very well. The message was that Mr. Avril wanted to see me on very urgent business. He requested that I come out to Starville that night at about eight o'clock and be sure not to mention my visit to anyone. Go on. Well, when I got to Starville, Roper explained that Mr. Avril was feeling too ill to see me. He had, however, written me a note. Roper then handed me a rather bulky envelope. Containing the £20 note? Yes. And a scribbled note from Mr. Avril. I don't recall the exact words. He, he said he was sorry, but he felt too unwell to undertake what must be a painful interview, and he didn't wish to put the facts in writing. He said Roper was entirely in his confidence and would explain it, and that... Well, since I would need money for what he was going to ask me to do, he was enclosing five hundred pounds, to which he would add a further sum if I found I required it. Have you got that, Tanner? Uh, yes, sir. Just about. Roper then went on to tell me a certain story. I can only say it, it's quite impossible for me to repeat it. But it involved a visit to France? Yes. I agreed to undertake the mission and took the notes. The house burnt down that night and Mr. Avril died. Nevertheless, I thought it my duty to go to France and and did so a few weeks later. Was your mission successful? Unfortunately not. Therefore, the trip cost me only my travelling expenses and I was left with £480 of Mr. Avril's money on my hands. I see. I decided to keep this and go out again to France at a later date and have another try at the business. That is the money which you found in my desk. Well, uh, Mr. Whimper, that could be the truth, but I have to tell you this. No jury on the face of this earth would believe it. You must tell us the exact nature of your mission to France. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't. It's not my secret. I wonder if you quite understand your position, Mr. Whimper. It has been established that some person or persons went to Starville on the evening we're speaking of, murdered Mr. Avril, Roper and his wife, stole Mr. Avril's fortune, and then set fire to the house. So far as we know, you alone visited the house that night. You admit having done so. Furthermore, some of the stolen money has been found in your possession. And yet, when I give you the chance to account for your actions, you won't take it. Do you not understand, Mr. Whimper, that if you persist in this foolish attitude... You will be charged with murder. So why didn't you? Hmm? Arrest him for murder. Tanner, I have a distinct feeling he's innocent. And if he isn't? Well, the way I see it is this. If this secret, whatever it is, was something discreditable affecting Miss Avril, wouldn't that account for Whimper's refusal to reveal it? Could be. On the other hand, he could be hiding information about the crime. He could be shielding the murderer. He could even have come along after the crime and finding proof of the murderer's identity have set fire to the house with the object of destroying the evidence. Speculation, all of it. Oh. But even if any of this were true, it would be a serious blunder to arrest him. That would merely prevent him from doing something by which he would give himself away. For example, attempting to communicate with an accomplice. You, uh, want him what, sir? Closely. Very good, sir. But Sergeant Ken can do that. Well, what about me, sir? You, Tanner, will be going to France. Eh? To Talois. Following in Whimper's footsteps. (laughs) Doesn't the prospect please you, Tanner? Foreign travel broadens the mind. Well, it's not so much my mind that bothers me, sir. It's my stomach. (laughs) What's more, I don't speak the lingo. Regarded as a challenge. I'll do my best, sir. Where will you be? Checking in Dr. Philpott's background. Oh. Then, it's back to Scotland Yard to report to Chief Inspector Mitchell. Sit down, French. Thank you, sir. Well, are you making any progress? Not a great deal, sir, I'm afraid. 
However, we are pursuing two lines of inquiry. And they are? Well, I've spoken to you briefly about Pierce Wimper. Yeah. But there's also this. A confession in which Dr. Herbert Philpot admits murdering his wife, Edna Philpot. Does he indeed? It was found in the safe deposit box of Simon Averill's servant, Roper. Oh. Now, I've established from the medical directory that Herbert Philpot is the same man who treated Avril. I see. Now, the directory shows that between 1913 and September 1921, when he set up practice for himself in Thursby, Philpot was working as junior assistant at the Morham Mental Institution at Kintillock, Scotland. The date on this is 15th of May 1921. Yes, that was four months before Philpot left for Thursby. Go on. At the offices of the Scotsman in Fleet Street, I searched the files for news of a fatal accident to a Mrs. Edna Philpot at Kintillock. And? I found it sooner than I expected. On the 17th of May, two days after the date on that confession, there was this short paragraph. Tragic death of a doctor's wife. As you see, it recounts how the deceased lady in some way tripped while descending the stairs at her home. She and her husband were alone in the house at the time. He heard her fall and rushed to her aid. But despite all his efforts, she passed away in a few minutes. Hmm. The death certificate reads, death from concussion resulting from a fall. Were the local police satisfied? Apparently not. But having gone into the matter more fully than would otherwise have been the case, and having discovered no suspicious circumstances, they dropped their inquiries. So, why the confession, and how did he come to be in Roper's strongbox? I'm coming to that, sir. According to Sergeant McGregor at Cantillac, I've spoken to him at length on the telephone, Roper was for six years an attendant at the Morham Institute working directly under Dr. Philpot. Also, yes. again, according to Sergeant McGregor, Roper was courting a certain Flora McFarlane at that time and married her soon after. And Flora McFarlane was the Philpot's maid. Further, it's interesting to note that though this young lady claims to have been out of the house at the time of the accident, she did return unexpectedly minutes later and heard Dr. Philpot telephoning for help. But if, in fact, she had actually witnessed the crime... Now, you're suggesting that Roper used his fiancée's knowledge to blackmail Philpot. That's the way it looks. It would certainly account for the confession being in Roper's strongbox. It might even account for the Roper's arrival in Thursby 18 months ago. Do we know why Roper left Kintilla? Yes. He was found to have given troublesome patients unauthorized drugs to keep them quiet. On the first occasion, he was led off the caution. On the second, he was instantly dismissed. Whereupon, he went to work for Avril. Yes, rather to everyone's surprise. Mm. He let it be generally known in Kintilla that he intended to start a new life in Brazil. He'd even obtained a passport and a Brazilian visa. Something must have happened to make him change his mind. Uh, returning to uh, Philpot, have we any evidence at all to associate him with the crime at Starville? None, sir. In fact, all the evidence suggests he was in bed with influenza at the time. His associate, Dr. Emerson, states he had a temperature of 102. Oh. And your other line of inquiry, this uh, whimper business? Isn't bearing much fruit either, I regret to say. Tanner's report from Anansi confirms that our prime suspect, Pierce Wimper, arrived at the Hotel Splendide on Friday the 8th of October and left there three days later on Monday the 11th. On Saturday the 9th of October, Wimper took a steamer to the village of Talois where he inquired widely about the whereabouts of a Monsieur Prosper Giraud and a Madame Madeleine Blancard. His search was unsuccessful, so he then went to the local gendarmerie and offered a reward of 5,000 francs for information as to the whereabouts of either. And what do you conclude from that? Well, I'm just guessing, sir, but the more I consider the whole affair, the more I feel that there's some secret in the Avril family, a secret so sinister that Wimper is willing to chance arrest rather than reveal it. One must assume, if that's the case, that the secret concerns but one person, Ruth Avril. She was born in Bayonne in southern France. There may be some question about her parentage. I'm making inquiries now. I see. You're still having him watched. Oh, yes, sir. Then I think a call on Dr. Philpott's in order, don't you? See what the man has to say. I'm accused of what? Murdering your wife, Dr. Philpott. At your home in Brayside, Kintillock, 
on the afternoon of the 15th of May, 1921, and I have information to support the charge. What does it consist of? A statement which alleges that you arranged the accident which befell your wife, and then, when this didn't kill her, as you'd hoped and intended, that you then struck her on the temple with a cricket bat. A cricket bat? Which did kill her. Now... Will you give me an explanation, or would you prefer to reserve your statement until you've consulted a solicitor? Ask your questions, and I'll answer them, if I can. Good. Dr. Philpott, did you ever admit to anyone that you had committed this murder? Never. Then how did you come to write this? Aren't you going to read it? Or is it that you recognize the document and know its contents already? Roper is somehow at the bottom of this, isn't he? Even after his death, his evil genius remains. What do you mean? Inspector, did you know that Roper worked under me at the Murrum Mental Institute in Kintilloch? Yes, I did. Well, one day I found Roper with his arms round one of the nurses, and I said I would report him. However, when he spoke up on the girl's behalf, uh, pointing out that she was good at her job, kindly and attentive, I decided, after all, to take no further action. And from that moment... Roper hated me. I could see it in his eyes. Go on. Uh, in May 1914, I, I married and set up house in, in Brayside. Then came the war. I joined the army in 1915 and was invalided out two years later and, and returned to my job at the Institute. After two years at the front, I, I was a changed man. Although I still dearly loved my wife, I... I found I was strongly attracted to other women. And so it happened that I in turn became guilty of the very offence about which I had threatened Roper. I formed a liaison with a nurse at the Institute. We used to meet at night in the grounds, and one night, by fate's irony, he found her in my arms. <laughs> The price of his silence was ten shillings a week. You paid him? Well, I had no choice. It was my reputation, my career to consider, and my poor wife. I took the coward's way out. To ensure continued payment, Roper said he must have a, a guarantee. In what form? Well, he insisted I write and sign a statement to the effect that I had been carrying on an intrigue with nurse of so-and-so at the Institute. I finally submitted even to this humiliation. And he said he'd keep the statement hidden as long as the money was paid. If it wasn't, he would send the note to the institution authorities. It would have meant my instant dismissal. How long did these payments continue? until my wife died. About a week after the funeral, Roper called at my house and said he was sure I would see that his knowledge had now become vastly more valuable. Ah, uh, sir? He said the police suspected me of murdering my wife, but weren't able to show a strong enough motive to take the case into court. But if he were to come forward and relate the incident with the nurse... I see. So... Asked him his price. It was two pounds a week. I agreed to pay it. However, I flatly refused to write him a confession of the crime which he said he required as a guarantee. I refused to avow a crime of which I was not guilty and dared him to do his worst. Whereupon... Yes? He... He took two photographs out of his pocket... One was an extraordinarily clear copy of my confession of the intrigue with the nurse, the other a copy of that document you brought, which he brazenly admitted he'd forged. You mean to say this is a forgery? Examine it closely and you'll see. Compare it with other samples of my handwriting. This. Or this. Huh? Let your experts examine it. Oh, there's a, a superficial resemblance, yes, but that's all. Inspector French, you have my word that I did not write that letter. Say you believe me. Please. Yes. Doctor, I... I rather think I do. 
Thank God. You left Kintillac soon afterwards, Dr. Philpott. Yes. Life there had become intensely painful to me. I resigned and set up my plate here, here in Thursday. But every week I sent two treasury notes to Roper. What brought Roper and his wife to Thursby? Well, the, the elderly couple who had been looking after Mr. Averill retired. He advertised for a married couple to take their place. That was about oh, 18 months ago. I received a letter from Roper saying that he had seen the advertisement and wished to apply. He asked me to put in a good word for him with Mr. Averill. Well, surely he refused. No. But Roper also said that if he got the job... He would cease his demand for the two pounds a week and send me the note he had forged. I see. Mr. Averill was my patient by this time, and I mentioned Roper to him. I felt I could do so with a clear conscience, but with all his faults, Roper was an excellent attendant. Also, his wife, Flora, was a hard worker, and I, I believed they would suit Mr. Averill well. However, I did warn Mr. Averill that Roper had been sacked from the Murrum and gave him the reason why. And that didn't put him off? Oh, no. He thought, for that very reason, he could get them cheaper. Ah, I see. They were engaged the following week. Hmm. And uh, was Roper as good as his word? Yes, sir. So it seemed. He handed me the forged note, and he watched me put it in the fire. But it seems he kept a copy. Hmm. But the blackmail stopped? Yes. From then to the day of his death, he was civil when we met, and... No unpleasant subjects were touched on. That, Inspector, is the whole truth of this unhappy affair. And do you believe him, sir? Experts at the yard have confirmed the confession was a forgery. Yeah, but who's going to pay blackmail for fear of a forged confession? Oh, I might have done so myself, Tanner. If it spared me the misery of arrest and possible trial. Besides, the episode of the nurse would have come out and Philpott's career would have been ruined. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think his story is true. Uh, we must go back to the beginning. Review the circumstances in detail. I think more clearly, if, if I could take a breather, sir. Ah, no, yeah, well, why not? I wouldn't mind a pipe. Oh, the... Yes, we'll, we'll shelter in that hollow. Come along. Yes, sir. <coughs> to my mind, Tanner, all, all roads lead to Roper, <coughs> who, from every point of view, seems to have been a thorough-paced blackguard. But, uh, you all right? Yes, sir. Mm. A clever rascal, too. Look how he wormed his way into Avril's confidence. <laughs> it's almost incredible that Avril should have entrusted a man like Roper with a secret which Wemper would risk a murder charge rather than reveal. <coughs> Perhaps he didn't, sir. Hmm? Well, I mean, Roper forged Philpott's writing well enough. Why shouldn't he have forged... For... Forged Avril's, too. <coughs> right. Tanner. Right. Well done. Mm. Let's pursue that thought. Wimper never saw Avril. He saw Roper, and only Roper. It was Roper who told him Avril wished to see him at Starville the evening of the fire. Secretly. No one was to know of the visit. And at the house, it was Roper who handed him a note purporting to be from Avril, stating that Roper would appraise him of the details of the mission to Talwa. Yes. <laughs> My heaven. It's possible that Roper forged that letter, too. But it wouldn't have been difficult. Wimper wouldn't have been familiar with Avril's handwriting. So, Roper could have engineered the whole thing. But why should Roper send Wimper to France? I don't know. Hmm. Well, possibly as a means of establishing whether the numbers of the banknotes were known, whether it was safe to pass them. Obviously, he couldn't do so himself or make inquiries at the bank without arousing suspicion. So he arranged for someone else to do it for him. Wimper. Well, why not? I, he knew how Wimper felt about Ruth and had some acquaintance with the Avril family affairs. Wimper's rather an unworldly young man, you know. Roper could easily have invented some story to make him his dupe. And the 500 pounds? Well, if Roper is our man, one can't avoid the assumption that he had stolen it from Avril's safe. Sir, the old man was in bed in the same <coughs> room. Ah, well, 
Roper could already have murdered him. Crikey. Or drugged him. I mean, Roper was dismissed from the Morum for drugging patients. He could have, he could have given Avril the same treatment. If you don't mind my saying, sir, it's all speculation. Yes, I'm afraid it is. And there's a major snag. What's that, sir? If Roper took the banknotes from the safe, then it was presumably Roper who replaced them with newspapers and set fire to them, signifying his intention to cover his tracks by later setting fire to the house. Yes. Well, how on earth could so clever a man as Roper have allowed himself and his wife to be caught in the fire he'd arranged for Avril? Sir? Well? There's a flaw in our reasoning. What? One thing Roper can't afford is the invitation to Miss Ruth from Mrs. Palmer Gore. Uh, so, it's back to work, Tanner. We must verify our facts. We'll divide our forces. I shall go to the church to drag the truth out of Wimper, while you... I know, sir. I get a day's outing to York. Sure you won't have one, Mr. T Tanner. Tanner. Uh, uh -huh. Not on duty, madam. <laughs> oh, well. <clears throat> Mrs. Palmer Gore? Mm. Mrs. Palmer Gore, <sighs> would you tell me just why you invited Ruth Averill here to your home some eight weeks ago? Mm. Well, Mr. Tanner, <laughs> I could scarcely have done anything else. Oh. Mr. Avril's note was phrased in such a way it would have been trolled for a few. Ah, uh, Mr. Avril wrote you a note? Mm. Yeah. Well, he, he wrote to say he had no wish to presume on an old friendship. Uh, but would I invite Ruth over for a day or two? Uh, he felt she'd benefit from a few days of cheerful society. <laughs> I agreed, of course. Mrs. Palmer Gore, mm. your um, friendship with Averill, would you describe it as close? Oh, by no means. We'd known each other as children, though I was always closer to his brother, Theodore, <laughs> who more than he. So you were surprised when Simon Averill wrote asking you to put his niece up? I was amazed. His letter was totally unexpected. Uh, Mrs. Palmer Gore, mm. uh, have you by any chance... Kept that letter. Yeah, very not. I was destroying answered letters. But you recognised Mr. Averill's handwriting. Well, we only exchanged Christmas cards, Mr. Tanner. <laughs> yes. I thought I did. Why do you ask? You never suspected the letter might be a forgery? No, never. However, it would explain a great deal. I confess. I can hardly imagine Simon writing such a note. <laughs> he was a proud man. Would have been totally out of character. 